year two. <laughs> Est-ce que ça marche? Oui, I can make it louder. <laughs> Est-ce que ça marche? Can you hear? Oui, est-ce que ça marche? Est-ce que ça marche pas? Okay, ça marche. Bon. <laughs> Technology is good, so we can begin. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, I shall speak uh, today of ideology in the contemporary world. But the first question is, uh, what is, after all, ideology? What is the meaning of the word ideology? In the work of Marx, in uh, the classical Marxist, if you want, ideology is the word, the name for the opinions and values of social class. Finally, ideology is always, for the classical Marxism, the ideology of the social class. Or if you want, ideology is the subjective effect of uh, the social objectivity. It's uh, the subjective level of the social organization, opinions, values, and so on. But uh, the very essence of uh, social objectivity is to be divided for Marx. Social objectivity must be sought not as something unified, but as something which is divided, divided by the class struggle, the contradiction between different classes. And uh, uh, finally, the class struggle, the political conflict between different classes. And so, you know, ideology is the subjective level of objectivity which is not unified, but objectivity which is divided. Divided fundamentally uh, in the historical movement by the class struggle. And uh, for the classical Marxism, in the modern world, this division, this division, this objective division, opposes the bourgeoisie to the proletariat. So we have a classical division of the society, of the social universe, in two opposite terms. Bourgeoisie against proletariat, we can say also the private property on one side against uh, the collective organization of production and uh, social order. So, if ideology is the subjective level of opinion and values of the social class, and if the objective world is divided, finally we cannot speak of one ideology, but always of two ideologies, two opposed ideology. And it's important because we, we cannot uh, simplify the situation by only speaking of one ideology. 
ideology is a dialectical concept. That is a concept which is also a contradiction. A contradiction between two completely different and opposite ideologies. So we have on one part the dominant ideology, the dominant one, which uh, is, in the contemporary world is the bourgeois ideology, and the dominated ideology, which is the proletarian ideology. So, at the end, we have something like the conflict between bourgeois ideology as a dominant ideology and the proletarian ideology with a dominated ideology. But we can speak more generally. After all, ideology is always values, opinions, and so on subjective determinations. So we can say, for example, that we have a conservative ideology against the revolutionary ideology. Conservative on the side of domination, to protect the domination, and revolutionary on the side of dominate to destroy the system, to destroy the social order. And at the end, at the more general level, we have something like capitalism on one side against communism on the other side. So in some sense, two different visions of the world itself. Not only some conflict between different opinions, but a sort of uh, major conflict between two completely opposed visions of the social order as such. Capitalism on one side against communism on the other side. That is just the classical vision of communist party and uh, of uh, <coughs> Marxist, classical Marxist, Durim, uh, something like uh, more than one century. We have, in my opinion, a new vision of uh, the word ideology in the work of uh, the French philosopher Louis Althusser. We have the same disposition but with something new, with a new element. First, we have in Louis Althusser also that the dominant ideology is opposed to the proletarian ideology. But more generally, Louis Althusser introduced the idea that there is an opposition between ideology, in general, and science. So it's not the contradiction between two different ideologies, but the more general contradiction between ideology and science. Ideology being something imaginary, in some sense, something at the level of pure representation of the real world, and science being the true concept of the world. And so we have philosophically two different oppositions. Contradiction, if you want, between two different contradictions. First one, the contradiction between two ideologies, two different ideologies. And we can see that the contradiction is contradiction between two particular ideologies. So if you want contradiction between two particularities, the particularities of ideology 
of bourgeoisie and the particularity of the ideology of the proletariat, of the workers, and so on. But we have an other contradiction, which is a contradiction between ideology and science, and which is, in fact, the contradiction between particularity on one side, ideology, and universality on the other side, with science. Understand? So it's a very complex dialectical framework between we have the contradiction between two particular terms and the contradiction between particularity as such and universality. So the problem is how we can construct a sort of uh, unity between this uh, complex construction and between these two levels, the levels of the classical ideological contradiction, that is the uh, bourgeois ideology against uh, the proletarian ideology, and the level which is more general between particularity and universality. That is the contradiction between ideology and science. The proposition of Althusser, which is interesting but uh, problematic, is that revolutionary ideology, if you want the good ideology, <coughs> is in close relationship to science. That is that there is something more universal in proletarian ideology than in bourgeois ideology. And that uh, conservative ideology is in close relationship not to science, but to some idealistic construction. Religion, for example, or all different forms of uh, idealistic concepts. So the construction of the question of ideology by uh, Louis Althusser imposes at the end that the good ideology, the revolutionary ideology, is something like a relation, a relationship between ideology and something else, that is, ideology and science. And so the class struggle at the level, at the ideological level, you know, the class struggle, in some sense, is also the contradiction between particularity and universality. It is the conclusion. And if proletarian ideology is the good one, is not only because it's the ideology of workers, of revolutionary people, of poor, against the domination, but also, and more fundamentally, because it's uh, the ideology which is on the side of universality. On the side of universality. And so, you know, there is a, uh, here a complex uh, situation that has many effects to the two, but I shall speak about them <coughs> later, which is that uh, the level where we can decide what is finally the good ideology the progressist ideology, the ideology of the future, the historical future, is not only the level of concrete conflict between classes, but also the metaphysical conflict between particularity and universality. And the relationship between these two levels is all the complexity 
of the situation. And this is why, at the end, we can say that the ideological conflict exists also at a philosophical level. First one is the conflict of two different classes at the social and historical level. After that is something like a more abstract conflict between particularity and universality. And at the end, in the conclusion of uh, Althusser, there is a conflict at the philosophical level, which is a conflict, the ideological struggle between idealism and materialism. Idealism on the side of uh, ideology without universality, and materialism, the ideology on the side of science, that is finally on the side of universality. That is the two most important <coughs> considerations concerning the concept of ideology uh, during uh, the, uh, uh, the last century. Like that. What is the situation today concerning all these questions? The problem is that it's clear today that the big part of capitalistic ideology, of dominant ideology, is clearly on the side of a form of materialism <coughs> and not on the side of idealism. <coughs> For our societies, which are dominated by capitalistic organization, the goal of existence is a good life, and this good life is material and social satisfaction. There is no great idea of existence, great idealistic idea of existence in our world today. The proposition, the most important proposition, is uh, to have a good life at uh, the material level first. For example, to have a good and interesting place in the social world. And to have the means uh, to buy uh, excellent things, as uh, houses, uh, cars, uh, computers, and so on. <coughs> and all that is perfectly of uh, material signification and not of idealistic one. It's very difficult today to say that the, the dominant ideology is on the side of idealism. Clearly, the dominant ideology of the capitalistic world is materialism. And uh, this material satisfaction, which is a common norm of existence today, is in close relationship to money, to the circulation of money, and with money, you can have access to the worldwide market, the universal market, with many products for your personal satisfaction. In all that, the global market, money, technology, products, satisfaction, and so on, we don't find anything which is of idealistic nature. <coughs> it's purely materialist. So maybe uh, the conclusion of Althusser, which is that the ideological contradiction is between materialism on the side of revolutionary ideology and idealism on the side of bourgeoisie, maybe this conclusion is false. And if 
that sort of conclusion is false, the problem itself must be more complex. Because on the other side, the proletarian ideology, the revolutionary ideas, and so on, today, it's a clearly an idealistic side. <coughs> it's on the contrary of all what is said before. The strategic idea of the communism, of free association, and so on, against the private property, is today probably an idealistic utopia. And so, uh, if you consider the world as it is, maybe you can have the conclusion that certainly there is a conflict between materialism and idealism, but it's the bourgeoisie which is on the side of materialism and the revolutionaries which are on the side of the idealism. And so we have a sort of uh, complete change of uh, the nature of the contradiction. And you say, say, for example, that science is on the side of the revolutionary ideology, but today science, uh, by the mediation of technology and uh, material production, science uh, seems to be on the side of capitalistic domination and not at all on the side of the revolutionary camp. And so at the end, the philosophical thinking of Althusser seems to be changed in its contrary, purely and simply. Materialism on the side of bourgeoisie and idealism on the side of proletariat and revolution. So what is the point? What is the difficulty in all this strange story. I think that the, the difficulty and the problem was that in all that sort of uh, historical vision of ideological conflicts, we have always only two terms, bourgeoisie and proletariat, materialism and idealism, and so on. But today, we must observe the development of a very important middle class. We cannot describe the contemporary world in the term of a simple conflict between bourgeoisie and proletariat, between private property and free association, and so on. In some sense, middle class, the middle class today, is the decisive class at the level of political determination. Middle class is the most important mass support to the capitalistic order. I give you uh, some numbers concerning this point. First of all, you have in the contemporary world 10% of uh, the global population, 10%, which uh, dispose 86% of uh, the wealth, of the global wealth. So 10% which possess really 86%. So we have a dominant group, a really dominant group at the purely economic level, which is very small, 10% of the population. We can speak of a dominant oligarchy, something like that. We have 50% which uh, have nothing at all. 
<coughs> the global ones. We can name this mass if you want proletarian masses. You can give this name. Proletarian class has always been the class with nothing. <coughs> so today, if we consider the part of the population which have nothing, we find half practically uh, 50%, and so we can name all that proletarian masses. Not only workers, it's not the same thing that the worker class, not only workers, but an enormous mass of people without any access to work, to money, and finally to market. So enormous mass of people with really uh, nothing, real access to the world as it is. And we have 40 persons which are the middle class, 40%, at the world as such. 40% which dispose of 14% uh, of uh, the wealth, of the global wealth. So we think the, the numbers are very, very clear. 10% the dominant group, 50% the mass, the global mass without nothing, and 40% the middle class. And the middle class dispose finally of 14% of the global wealth. No? So we have 10% with 86%. We have 40% with nothing, and we have 40% uh, with 14%. Okay? So, we have a pure obligation to dispose the question of ideology, not in the reference to two terms, but certainly to three terms. The dominant group, the large masses without anything, and the middle class. And uh, so we can describe the world as a composition of three terms and not by the strict class struggle between two terms only. We have a financial and commercial and industrial oligarchy. We have the proletarian masses. We can take the Marxist name, and we have the modern middle class, the modern middle class. The modern middle class is largely concentrated today in Western world. If we name Western world the countries with a strong capitalist structure, Europa, North America, Japan, and so on. And so the question is now, what is the ideological disposition of the middle class? That is the great enigma of our world. What is the ideological vision of uh, the middle class? I think that uh, the ideological disposition of the middle class today is composed of two different elements. It's not a simple disposition, but a contradictory disposition. The first element is that clearly today, maybe it's not uh, forever, but today, the middle class accepts the domination of capitalism, so the middle class accepts the domination of a small oligarchy under some conditions. <laughs> under some conditions. Conditions concerning individual freedom, first. 
So you accept the global domination of the small oligarchy, but under the condition, some condition concerning individual freedom and uh, many consequences of uh, individual freedom, uh, freedom of opinions, uh, freedom of press, and so on and so on. We can see that also that the middle class accepts global capitalist domination if locally exists a democratic form of the state. This is the first disposition, global disposition of the middle class today, and it's very important to have a clear idea of this point. Okay, the domination of uh, the concentration of capital in the hands of a small uh, oligarchy, it's acceptable under the condition, finally, of uh, the democratic form of the state locally, where you are, where you live. And it's also a relationship, complete relationship between the global situation and the local situation. At the level of the global market, finally, we have the domination of uh, the capitalist structure, but we must have locally in the form of a country or a state, a democratic structure. And it's what I name democratic materialism. So a complex designation. Materialism, because you accept finally the material structure of the world organization of economy, organization of production, private property, and so on. Democratic, because you accept under the condition of uh, uh, individual freedom and consequences, and all consequences of individual freedom. So the first part of uh, the ideology of uh, the middle class can be named democratic materialism. The second point, the second element, is that the middle class refuses to be confused with the big mass of very poor people. So they accept the domination, but the does not accept to be confused with the enormous mass of uh, people which have nothing at all. And so, when it exists a crisis of capitalism, when we have a sort of crisis of domination, like in Europa uh, from uh, in the uh, last year, in Europa from practically 2008, the middle class is afraid. <coughs> the middle class is in a sort of trouble. And this trouble is manifest by the form of aggressive tendencies against minorities, strangers, nomads, and so on. I describe the situation in Europa first. The fear of uh, the middle class is to be downgraded, to be lower in status. And the result of all that, this disposition, aggressive tendency against minorities, stranger, nomad, and so on, I name all that conservative materialism. The strict necessity to a sort of security concerning the status of middle class. Don't be confused with the big poor masses. So, 
to describe finally in a, a complete manner the situation, the ideological situation of uh, the middle class today, we can say something like that. We have a, a background which is of materialist nature. Materialism, which is modern materialism, that is finally acceptation of uh, capitalism and acceptation of uh, the global power of a small oligarchy. That is the background of uh, the ideology of the middle class. But after that, we have a contradiction in some sense. Concerning this materialism, between democratic materialism, that is the condition of acceptation of domination, the form of a, a democratic state, uh, uh, personal freedom, uh, freedom of opinion, and so on, and the conservative materialism, which is dominated by the fear to uh, be confused at the end with the large masses of the poor people. And all that explain, and it's the only clear explanation, the structure of the modern state. The democratic structure of the modern state. Because finally, in the democratic state model, as you know, you have two parties, Democrats and Republicans, and more generally, <coughs> left and right. <coughs> it's the general law. So we have the part of conservative materialism, the right, and the part of democratic materialism, the left. <laughs> it's clear. <laughs> and you perfectly know that the two parties agree with the general capitalist form of society. <laughs> so they are representative of the background, the materialist background. There is a consensus. So there is no revolutionary disposition at all. You have fundamental acceptation, political acceptation, of uh, the background of the form of uh, the global domination of oligarchy. But we have the division in the state and the political organization of the society between the two dimensions of the materialism, the democratic one, which is incarnated by the left, and the conservative one, which is <coughs> in the disposition of uh, the right. And this is why, in the modern democratic state, we must have two parties, and not one. Because you have effectively two parts in the ideology of the middle class, and as you know, the middle class is the dominant class for the political level of the organization of the state. So if you are the left wing and the right wing is inside the common vision of materialism, it is a common vision of the global organization of society and the difference concerning the democratic materialism on one side, which is a condition to accept the domination, and the conservative materialism on the other side, which is the fear of middle class to become, to become in the mass of uh, the poor, which are nothing. So, 
we have here a global description of the contemporary world as it is. Today, the political power stay inside the opposition between democratic materialism and conservative materialism, which is finally the ideological structure of the middle class. That is the ideological structure of practically 40% of the population of the world. And the middle class, which shares 14% of the global wealth. So, the political field today is not properly a field of uh, ideological struggle. There is no real to different ideologies, which would be represented by the left and the right, uh, democratic and republican, and so on. All that is inside the same materialism, but with two uh, parts of the materialism, the democratic part and the conservative part. And so our problem is, where is uh, the ideological struggle, finally? <coughs> yeah. And is there something like a true ideological struggle in this structure where, finally, we have difference inside the same political system with two orientation of the same materialism? And so the question is that you can have a real ideological struggle only if we have an ideology which is outside the dominant materialism. And so the true political question is uh, not exactly the classical contradiction in the field of the state power, but the possibility of a contradiction between the two parts of the state power and something which is not reducible to the conflict between materialism, democratic materialism and conservative democracy. That is a possibility of something which is outside because it don't accept, finally, the domination of uh, the small oligarchy. They see a part which don't accept the materialism itself. The materialism has the dominant structure of the capitalist, the global uh, the <coughs> capitalism of today. And there is something new, in fact, only when something is a symbol, a representation, or maybe a real point of something which is outside. Or outside for a part. That is the novelty, the possible novelty of uh, ideology. And sometimes we have the possibility of something which is inside and outside. <coughs> it's my interpretation of Bernie Sanders today <coughs> in your country. That is, Bernie Sanders is certainly inside <coughs> because it is in Democrat Party and uh, he is candidate to be candidate to be president. <coughs> A candidate to be candidate to be president is certainly to be inside the system in some sense. 
But it is outside. Why? It is outside because it is candidate to be candidate under the general admission to not be probably candidate <laughs> and to certainly not be president. You know? So the subjective symbol of Bernie Sanders is the symbol of the possibility of outside, not the real of outside, because he is inside, but he is inside the symbol of the possibility of something outside. And this is why he is interesting. <laughs> notably for the youth people. <coughs> it is interesting because it is the experience of the possibility of something ideologically outside. And finally, if you have an attempt to explain the signification of Bernie Sanders at the philosophical level. <coughs> Bernie Sanders is finally the attempt to be on the side of democratic materialism without being on the side of conservative materialism, without being on the side of conservative materialism. And here to separate the two dimensions of uh, consensual materialism, you understand? And probably it's uh, something for the future which is real. That is to create novelty in the political field probably must be today to propose a democratic materialism, which is a radical uh, democratic materialism. That is a democratic materialism without any strong relationship to conservative materialism. And so it's a necessity to define a sort of new way from inside to outside and not only to be completely outside, because to be completely outside is something like an abstraction. In some sense, in the world of today, you are inside, uh, everybody is inside. But we can be inside, like Bernie Sanders, but many more possibilities, it's so only a symbol to be outside in the sense yeah, that you affirm inside the domination of outside. And the, precisely in the field that I describe, you affirm the possibility of a purely democratic materialism. But democratic materialism exists in some sense, as a tendency, but under the law of conservative materialism. And the separation between the two open the possibility of something really new, that is the possibility of something which is really outside. And it's at this point that I can give you some indication concerning the present situation in my country. As you know, we have had horrible, terrible mass murder in Paris recently. <laughs> and uh, how we can explain, how we can give a, a rational vision of something which by itself is irrational. Something like uh, murder of uh, people which are here, which are that you don't know, uh, it's not a murder uh, with a direction, with a signification, not at all. It's a pure murder of people. And it symbolically is clearly a murder of middle class. The idea of kill the middle class. 
and it was the, the place itself, the Bataclan, the <coughs> was a place for small middle class, not rich middle class, small middle class, ordinary middle class, and use of ordinary middle class. And so it was the idea, the symbolic idea, to destroy the middle class of the Western world. And it was also why Paris was a symbol, as a symbol value, as a cultural capital of, of the Western world. And why? Why? Then it's the idea that today, to be outside is to be outside the middle class. And it's also the subjective conviction that to be outside the middle class is in some sense also impossible. It's a necessity, but it's impossible. And so we have the idea that the only possible relation to the middle class today is to destroy destruction. Destruction. Death. And so we have the conflict between two visions today concerning our world. When we accept to see what is an evidence, that is the that the middle class is the modern class, is the creation of the modern capitalism, the true creation. The difference between a small oligarchy and a mass of people without anything is an old uh, situation. It is a situation, 10% of the population was the num <coughs> number of uh, nobility in France during the 17th century. So it's not this difference is not a novelty. The, the positive novelty, the creation of the modern world is the middle class. With all its ambiguity, all its uh, internal division and so on, but it's the creation. And so the middle class is a symbol of capitalistic modernity. It's true. And when you are outside, purely outside, we have two possibilities. We have the possibility to modify uh, uh, something inside, that is to modify, to transform the situation inside and outside, like Bernie Sanders. <coughs> and the other possibility is to create something which is purely outside, but we know today that something which is purely outside is by necessity of destructive nature. That is, that the action of something purely outside is necessarily a destructive one, a purely destructive one. And the mass murder is a symbol of a, a sort of death drive, uh, which is applied to the, uh, uh, to the middle class, and you destroy yourself too. So uh, they all commit suicide uh, without difficulty, because all that is under the sign of pure negativity. And pure negativity is always also your proper negativity, your proper inexistence. And so, the problem, the modern political problem is not at all to create a pure destructive outside. It's not at all the conservative vision to be inside and nothing else. That is to accept for eternity. <coughs> the classical situation with uh, democratic materialism, conservative materialism, and uh, <coughs> one day it's the right, uh, and uh, the second day it's the left. <coughs> so the true way is to divide the middle class, 
to create a, a contradiction internal to the class, to create the possibility of something which creates from inside a new form of outside. And that is politics. I define politics, true politics, which is not the conservative politics, which is not the classical democratic politics. Politics is the attempt to propose to some part of the middle class to be on the side of the poor masses which are outside. and to go beyond the fear to lose their status. To convince a part of middle class that the true modernity of the middle class is to go beyond the constant hesitation between democratic materialism and conservative materialism. So, to have the courage to go outside, to see outside, to understand the people who are outside, to be with them, not to create a pure destructive outside, but to create a new possibility for a part of the middle class itself. And finally, to create the possibility to refuse the domination of the small oligarchy. That is to refuse progressively the conservative part of the ideological dimension of the middle class. That is really to separate the democratic element from its capitalistic background, to isolate the democratic element as such outside his capitalistic background. And so, philosophically, in the creation of a new materialism. And so, it's not the contradiction between materialism and idealism, it's the contradiction between two different materialism, something different. Because to create a materialism which is without uh, the acceptation of uh, the small oligarchy is, in the contemporary situation, the creation of a new materialism. A materialism without oligarchy. And without the monstrous power of a small group, financial, commercial, and industrial. But the, the, the terrible nihilistic murder mass, we can interpret them as the impossibility to create as such something outside, and to create as such a new materialism. The new materialism is the creation of something which is in the possibility to go from inside to outside and not to, to invent an outside absolutely separated to the middle class. I have named this possibility a dialectical materialism. And you, you understand why because it's a materialism which is created by a contradiction inside materialism itself, to separate the two parts of the, the democratic materialism. And so maybe, philosophically, the question today, which is a new in regard to the contemporary world as it is politically, but absolutely new against the 
this drive of terrorism and uh, murder mass, this invention of a new materialism, of a dialectical materialism, is really something new, finally. Because it's something new, not only against the terror, against the test drive, against uh, the fiction of something purely outside, but also completely new in regard to the conservative world as it is. And the point is to transform the idea of equality, the idea without any dominant oligarchy, so the idea of equality in a materialist power, finally. To transform the idea which is opposed to the conservative part of materialism classical in a materialist power, but the power of a new materialist, the power of a, the dialectical materialism. And so uh, we can <coughs> propose a conclusion of all that. At the beginning, we have the idea that ideological, at the ideological level, we have the opposition of two terms bourgeoisie and proletariat and so on. After that, we have the idea that uh, uh, ideological contradiction is contradiction at a philosophical level between materialism and idealism. And at the end, uh, we have the contradiction between two materialism. But this contradiction between two materialism democratic materialism and dialectical materialism is a contradiction which we must construct, which is not here. It's not a contradiction of the world as it is. It's a contradiction that we must invent and inscribe in the concrete world by separation of what is today unified. So democracy today is in some sense uh, the slave of conservative materialism. And we must uh, organize the liberation of democracy. That is my proposition. Thank you. <coughs>
the political is being very shot through in, in the Jesus work with the mathematical. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's difficult for me to um, sort of read the political work without seeing the mathematical language in there. But, but I also don't see the dialectic in the mathematics. Right. So in the mathematics as it stands? Yes. Work. Moi, ce que je veux dire, je voudrais savoir où est le directif dans le mathématique. Où est le mathématique dans le directif Ah oui. <laughs> ok. Mais, you know, you know, for me, mathématiques uh, is only uh, uh, the possibility to understand, to formalize uh, what is being as such. Being quali. So it's the ontological part of thinking. But ontological part of thinking, in my vision, and this difference with Hegel, for example, ontological part is not directing at all. It's a, a science of pure multiplicity without, in fact, the action of negativity. And so uh, I, I, it's not a problem for me to don't discover dialectics in mathematics. Mathematics is only uh, the most uh, uh, abstract part of uh, general knowledge. That is the knowledge in every thing which exists of uh, the fact that they, that they, that they are. So it's a, it's a simplification of to be as such. So uh, dialectics is something after that. And, in my language, uh, dialectics begins with the idea of an event, not with the idea of pure being. And this is why we have question of dialectics in, uh, uh, in politics, uh, in artistic creation, in, in love, and so on. But we have not the question of dialectics at the level of pure being. And this is why mathematics, in some sense, is not of dialectical nature. Um, as I was listening to yourself, um, I, especially when you were speaking of Althusser and his uh, final um, failure, or rather false solution, I felt compelled to kind of uh, mount the defense of Althusser. But um, it seems like uh, Althusser was in the end vindicated once you mentioned dialectical materialism in a way you were returning to Althusser, who uh, developed this term and uh, identified it with Marxist science, essentially. So I was actually thinking if we can uh, propose a more thorough return to Althusser, um, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, you mentioned that there is a certain reversal between materialism and idealism. Um, idealism now belongs on the side of the left, um, whereas materialism belongs on the side of conservative politics and dominant ideology. Um, but there is also another reversal between uh, universality and particularity, because um, in American politics, um, the left is largely associated with liberalism, which is all about identity politics. Uh, we don't talk about the proletariat anymore. We talk about particular identities and various liberties, rights, freedoms that should be given to these particular identities. And it's very much in line with democratic materialism, as you say. Uh, so I'm thinking, um, shouldn't the um, dialectical materialism, in fact, um, align itself with universalism. Because um, that's what the proletariat is. It's the universal class. And uh, it's precisely uh, the matter of thinking of that 50% of people who have nothing as not a collection of particular identities, but as a kind of universal class. And that's essential to ultimately refusing um, the dominant structure the way things are. 
So I was thinking, uh, wouldn't um, dialectical materialism be, in a way, a return to Althusserian flow? Or are you proposing something entirely new? Yeah. You know, there is certainly uh, one dimension of uh, my proposition, which is on the side of Althusser. I agree with you on one point. If, if we concentrate the Althusserian position around the question of contradiction between particularity and universality. And why? Uh, it's, it's because, because the contradiction inside uh, uh, materialism, bourgeois materialism, <coughs> the contradiction between democratic materialism and conservative materialism is also the impossibility to propose a true universality. It's also a restriction to something which is finally uh, in the dimension of identity and particularity. So the global question is the relationship, uh, in some sense, between emancipation equality and universality. And more precisely, the relationship between equality and universality, which is a very complex problem. Because, for example, you cannot have uh, true equality uh, without uh, equality between identities, <coughs> which is uh, the right of minorities and so on. But identities as such uh, cannot be universal. So we have the space for a new uh, political uh, formation is certainly to find the way where we have not too much tension, too much contradiction between equality on one side and universality on the other side. And it's very difficult because we can also have the fear that Universality is something which is imposed to uh, different forms of uh, identities and the multiplicity and the differences. And so, if we return to uh, the question of uh, uh, the contradiction between universality uh, and particularity, uh, we are in the new field where the the very difficult political question is how is it possible to affirm equality not against differences, but across differences? And finally, in some sense, across particularities. And uh, it is why the new materialism, the new dialectical materialism, is not the contradiction between democratic materialism and conservative materialism, but is probably the tensions, the difficulties uh, between, uh, uh, between universality and, uh, uh, and equality, but equality inside differences and not against differences. And so we have a, a new composition of concepts, which are identity, equality, and universality. And this dialectics is the new uh, possible dialectics in the political field, with three terms and not two. ask you a question about your use of materialism. When you talk about the shift from Althusser and materialism associated with the proletariat to a contemporary materialism associated with elites and with the good life, 
It seems to me these are different kinds of materialism. The first is materialism as a logical explanation of the contradictions of capitalism, and that's, if you like, obviously as science. The other is a materialism as an outcome, how much stuff I have in my hand. Can we call both of these really the same thing? Yes, your, your, your question is a good one because in some sense there is in uh, the work of Althusser uh, uh, a two, a two, two big plays for science. I am, I am also for science. I am <laughs> not against science, not at all. I am not an obscurantist. <laughs> but, but the place of science is really uh, the symbol of a sequence of uh, the historicity uh, of philosophy in France, in fact, which is the structuralist moment. Inside the structuralist moment, there is uh, a very scientific orientation of thinking in general. And I think we find that in Althusser. And so, certainly, our final dialectical materialism is, is not a scientific materialism. It's something like uh, logical determination inside thinking in general, uh, philosophical uh, in, uh, in, in some sense. So I agree with you, we, we, we can return to Althusser only uh, on the side of uh, the question of universality. But for me, the question of universality is not reducible to the question of science. Not at all. Certainly, science is a part of uh, universal knowledge concerning some phenomena, but it's not at all uh, science done cover all the field of the question of universality. And so there is something much more open that the science is the sense of uh, what you say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alain. This is wonderful. Thank you all for coming today. We look forward to seeing you back here on Thursday. Did you get a good recording? J'espère. Oh, it's still on. I'm going to wait down.